Welcome to On The Level, broadcasting from the Blue Ocean Network studios here in Beijing. My name is Fergus Thompson. Now, earlier this year, a young man calling himself Xiang Xiaohan sued the Hunan provincial government when it refused to register a gay rights organization that he had set up uh, in that province. Now, in its letter to Xiang, uh, the government not only said that his organization had no legal basis, it also said that what he was doing was against traditional Chinese culture and the social construction of morality. Now, he took the government to court uh, not only to have it reverse its decision, possibly, but also uh, to uh, demand an apology for what he saw as defamation, not only of himself, but also of his community. Uh, the court uh, did accept the case, but he didn't actually hear it. It threw it out, saying that there wasn't enough information. And uh, Xiang has said he will appeal. Now, uh, ironically, uh, Xiang had had problems with the uh, government before, the, this particular government, precisely because he hadn't registered his organization. So this sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't uh, official attitude is just one of the frustrations uh, that uh, people pushing for gay rights in China can come up against from time to time. And uh, today to discuss the reality of uh, being gay in China in 2014, I'm delighted to be joined uh, in studio by Ben Zhang and uh, Wei Xiaogang. Now, Ben is a talent agent uh, representing a number of high-profile Chinese actors. He's also been involved in organizing gay events in the past, including the abort of 2010 uh, Mr. Gay China, and we'll have more about that in a minute. And uh, Wei Xiaogang, Xiaogang is the executive director of the Beijing Gender Health in, uh, Education Institute, uh, based obviously here in Beijing. Uh, welcome both of you to On The Level. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, I'm not sure exactly how much you are aware of the uh, Xiang Xiaohan case. Uh, Xiao Gang, I believe uh, you, you know the gentleman involved indeed. Uh, but this sort of official uh, blocking of an organization like this, uh, is it something that you've come across before? I, I'm thinking, Ben, in your case, we talked about the, the 2010 Mr. Gay China. Now, it, it wasn't uh, forbidden per se for what it was, but it didn't go ahead. Tell us a bit of what happened there. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it was pretty much the same situation uh, as it was as it is for Xiang Xiaohan, because uh, we were organizing the first, very first Mr. Gay China event in China, and uh, we didn't go ahead with it. We were pretty much like shut down an hour before it was uh, it was going to go go ahead. Um, what we were told that we didn't have the right permit. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the right permit, there are different versions of like what we lacked uh, for, uh, for organizing a such kind of event. So different people were saying you were missing different papers. Exactly. There was no like, you know, Sometimes it's like, you know, you need to have security guards of like certain number. Sometimes it's like, you know, you have to register with the office, uh, with a certain office. Uh, and sometimes they're like, and just coming, they were coming to me with all different kinds of uh, excuses, uh, but none of none of which, uh, which I have to claim, I have, I have to state that uh, has to do with the fact that this is the gay event. Right. None, none of which was stated openly that that was why it was. Exactly. Right. But you know, but the result was, it, was it didn't go ahead. They didn't go ahead, and I'm pretty sure that it was because it was the LGBT event. Right. Mm. Uh, Xiao Gang, you organize uh, other events here. One of them is this, uh, um, as we can see, <laughs> the China AIDS walk on, on, on the Great Wall. Have you had any problems in terms of, of permissions uh, and, and organizing this? Mm, not really so far, because the, the China AIDS walk, we try to work with the government foundation, so we can get like our security because working by working with the Chinese government foundation. But you know, back to the Xiang Xiaohan, I, I do want to add, add something. Y I think you give quite a you know introduction about like what's happening with mm -hmm. registration. But actually, the other thing pe people probably, probably doesn't know, he organized probably the first like gay pride in China. Really, I mean pride walk on the street. Right. So that was literally a, a pride. I think last year they have like 120 people walk outside, and then. Uh, Everything was finished until like uh, midnight, like uh, around like uh, 2 a.m. The, the police came to the hotel, like uh, like uh, arrest him and for put him in a detention. He, he spent some time in detention, is that 12 right? days. 12 days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there was an interesting thing is like you see this is a quite a d difficult, but for him, he feel like uh, if he think 12 days can exchange a pride. He won't do this every day. I, I, I mean, every year for right. like a gay pride. Right. Actually, now they're organizing a new one. This year is going to be happening in, a, in a June. Uh, 
Right. So, so he's going ahead with this. He's not uh, dis deterred whatsoever. No, he's amazing because he's 19 years old. Last year he's 19 years old. This year is 20. And last year, you know, when he was in the detention, he start start talking to like a, a 30 more than 30 policemen and about like, you know, being LGBT, being gay, and uh, he feel like the 11 days are, you know, just really short for him, uh, like uh, to educate everyone. So <laughs> That's amazing, he, he took advantage yeah, of yeah. the fact that he right. was in prison, yeah. detention, to, uh, to educate the police yeah. force. Well, this is uh, 2014, you're, you're, what happened to you was, it was 2010. Has there been well, we a difference since your time? I mean, we were exactly taken away for no. five hours. We, I, I guess I didn't take that chance to uh, educate the people <laughs> around me. Uh, me and my, uh, Xiang Xiao, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I was, I wasn't uh, courageous as uh, Mr. Xiang is today. Uh, five years ago, we were quite. Um, I was quite shocked. Uh, and afraid mm -hmm. of something bad was going to happen to me. Um, we were taken away for four or five hours. Uh, me and my uh, co co founder, co organizer, uh, Nunu, -Nu, um, we were just, you know, sat down talking to the policemen, um, like laying out all the facts. And but, like, you know, they were just like, they were just like getting all the information, telling us that this is not what you're supposed to do. But they didn't tell us openly or clearly that we're shutting you down because this is a gain event. Right. Uh, why do you feel that there is this official uh, concern? Why are they so worried? Is it simply because, in terms of an organization like Xiang Xiao Hans, that it's an organization which the government or the party can't control, uh, and that could happen to any mm. organization, or is there some particular problem with LGBT organizations? Xiao Gang? <laughs> I you know, for what my understanding, I think it's not just because LGBT. I think it's about like, um, you know, in China, I think uh, uh, the government sometimes is a bit worried about like people have ability to mobilize and other people to do things. It, it, speaking to the press after uh, this blew up in the press, Yang Xiaohan's uh, case, he said, um, I think it was to the BBC, he said, if gay and lesbian people have no place in China's traditional culture, he's referring to the, the letter from the government, how can you encourage them to pursue the China dream? Now, mm. the China dream, obviously, he's using the phrase mm. of the moment, uh, mm. President Xi Jinping's sort of slogan of uh, China dream. Um, would you agree with him? I mean, doesn't seem to have held you guys back. <laughs> ben? I think it's well put. I I cite with him on that. Um, this is this China's dream is a new concept, obviously, um, but with uh, the the improvement of the society and the press, and I think this is this is one sign um, that a, a positive sign that like Mr. Xiang is is uh, stepping up to uh, taking action like this uh, uh, thanks to that and mm -hmm. um, and this is this itself the whole thing itself is part of the China's dream and I am really glad that he is doing all this um, to tell the community that um, we should deserve a place in the mm -hmm. in the in the society in the, in the well the, what we've been looking at here is sort of more official uh, attitudes from the from the government, or as, as in China's often is, is is from from the party. Turning more to the social uh, side of things, the, the the community, the Chinese public. Now, in any country, attitudes towards LGBT community do depend to a certain extent on traditional cultures and beliefs. You talk about Islamic countries, mm. some African countries, um, mm. the Russia more recently, indeed parts of the United States. Uh, it can be not only uncomfortable, but in some cases dangerous simply mm -hmm. to be and identify mm -hmm. yourself as gay. Mm -hmm. Do these traditional uh, beliefs or, or, or customs in China have effects on the LGBT community and, and, and you guys? I do think it's a good question, but I, I have to say, you know, like, uh, this is a part of the thing, maybe we don't have like strong, uh, how do you say, the religion background, mm -hmm. you know, maybe people don't like it, like uh, hate them because you know they f they see them as a sin. Uh, as you see in, in yeah. some parts of the United States, for yeah, example. Yeah, but uh, I do think because the, the also the value of like a tr you know the, the family value, 
and the one child policy, it does also put a lot of pressure on people. You know, you're being raised in a certain way, you have to really give back to your parents. So, so you know, this is why I think there's, they have a report on like, uh, about like more than 80% again, lesbian people are getting married because there's something they have to do for their family. This is according to uh, uh, Qingdao University, Zhang Beichuan, um, saying that 90% of the nation's gay men get married to heterosexual women uh, in an effort to conform with social norms. Really? Would, would you put it at 80 to 90% from your own experience? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know the number was that high. Uh, but but it, would you, it, is it believable for you? I, I guess. Mm -hmm. It is still, uh, on that note, I, w I want to say that um, most of the, most of the uh, gay Asian men or Chinese men uh, choose to like, start a family uh, uh, under the pressure. Um, they just, I guess, they just feel like you know, that's the right thing to do. Um, but I, I don't know. I still have, I still have belief that this is getting better mm -hmm. over, the, over the years. Uh, uh, and I want to quote um, uh, Li Yinhe on this because she says like you know this tolerance of the press and the, and the public to homosexuality is getting better and better. And this is uh, her her view, and she's like this pioneer in this uh, respect. The family is extremely important in Chinese mm. society. The family, and of course, if you go back to Confucian, respect for your elders and, and, and what they believe. Do you think mm -hmm. that? So I guess she, what she's trying to say is that uh, the Chinese public uh, and press are getting more and more uh, tolerable to uh, LGBT mm -hmm. press uh, uh, community. It's just that uh, this whole family issue, it's getting uh, a lot of pressure on the individuals right. to get married, to start a family. There is an organization, and I'm sure you're aware of them, Xiaogang, called the uh, uh, Parents, Family and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, which, P -flag. which are yeah. uh, PFLAG, who, who, who do activate yeah. in, in they're, this they're, matter. They're doing really good. How, 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 uh, no, it's, yeah. how active are they, and, and, and how many families do they, do they represent? Do they? Oh, I have to say the, the PFLAG in China, the, I would say they're the one of organization going really fast since mm -hmm. like a 2011 I would say yeah they now they have every year they have like a four or five like a regional like a, the, like this kind of family meetings you know there are like a really a hundred parents are participate you mm -hmm. know because they you know there's common thing their their daughter or son or like you know gay or lesbian or some are transgender people so yeah, I do think it's just really important because I think this is important thing to, to not just talk about the gay and lesbian, also to, to, to say, you know, gay and lesbian, a lot of gay and lesbian also have uh, heterosexual parents. Yes. You yeah. know. Do you ever have any sympathy for somebody in that particular situation who would find your lifestyle alien to what they have known all their lives and, and, and simply can't accept it? Do, do, does, does that ever arise? Um, Sometimes I, I, you know, I do think, you know, it doesn't matter if they have to, you know, I'm not looking for like people accept my life. Right. This is my life. You know, like I'm not asking for you, are you accept me to leave or not? No. And, you know, I'm just, you know, you have your reason to live your life. I have my reason. Maybe there's a com some conflection, but as long as we are talking about this. And you, I think that's like a, th that's a very important part. I think in China sometimes it's a silence is a, a big deal. Like you know, like uh, people don't talk about this. Mm -hmm. And also when they come to the rights point, like nobody talking about it. I you know I don't you know I, I don't think you know as a gay people. <laughs> let me say this. There's always when I when go to school, we do the talk with students. They they're always have some very kind students ask me so. So what we can do for the LGBT people? I always say, for me to think LGBT is not about just about LGBT, it's being everybody are different. We always in a certain circumstance will be the minority. You know, you're not tall, you're not pretty, you're not, you know, you're always not fitting. You, you probably in different situation, you're going to be minority. I think to feel how you feel when you're a minority, when you know what you want and when you be a minority, you know how to treat other people. I think that's, that's it. It's not just about like treating LGBT but different. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, what you treat you when you being in a very minority, how you want to be treated by other people, how you feel. I think that's really important. You mentioned 
uh, going to schools and doing and doing yeah. talks in schools. Uh, is there growing up in school, Ben? I mean, when you were growing up in in a, in a town on the coast or east coast of mm -hmm. China, um, what was that like? Did you did you was it difficult to be in school at, the, uh, at a time when a minority would be singled out and looked down upon? Well, sadly, uh, when I was in school, uh, up till I was, I guess, 18, I didn't even come across with the term homosexuality mm -hmm. anywhere. Zero. Like in the magazine, newspaper, TV, anywhere. Like it simply doesn't exist. And as you probably knew, uh, up until 1997, homosexuality was still illegal in China. And it was still regarded as uh, immoral until 2001. So it was just nowhere to be found. And if you didn't, if if, if you didn't have access to that kind of uh, stuff in your life, how how do you have a self identification when you're, regardless of how old you are? So how do you? I guess somehow I just uh, um, I guess saw it somewhere maybe it's like you know Hong Kong films or uh, with the internet the arrival of the internet that really helped a lot um, so it just I guess the per se pervasiveness of, of, of internet nowadays really really um, is a big contribution to the, the growth of the LGBT community I think it's amazing. I, uh, we have to thank the internet for mm. that. Not just the internet now. Uh, I think over the past a couple of years, uh, probably f five to six years, the, chi the Chinese press and um, and the Chinese press are, are becoming more and more open right. about this. Uh, you can you can read about it, uh, like um, even. Uh, for uh, in this in the case of Xiang Xiaohan, yes. a lot of uh, mainstream media reported about it. The organizations are going to be mentioned. Uh, P Flag, this uh, parents and friends organization, uh, they recently or the recent past, they actually wrote to uh, President Xi Jinping's wife, uh, Peng Yuan, uh, famous in her own right uh, as a as a singer, uh, to ask her to to put some sort of a, a, a face on 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 this community, this organization. Uh, I don't know if they've had any answer from her yet, but no, they haven't. But how long do you think it will be before somebody of that public stature comes out for the gay community in China? That's a hard one. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> question. I think that I've been asked a lot, you know, even people ask, like, uh, you know, because you haven't seen any public figures in mainland China that came out as gay person. I'll really speak out about, like, uh, I mean, possibly even speak out about, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, LGBT issues. So, yeah, it's a very difficult question. I don't know. I, I really don't know. On that know. note, I remember that uh, probably last year, while the Lianghui, uh, the Congress was uh, was going on. And These are the political conferences that happen e each year in Beijing. Yes, Beijing. early early every year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think some organization, they sent out over a hundred letters to yeah. every congressman um, um, trying to propose the same-sex marriage to them. One of, uh, one of the congressmen or congresswomen uh, kind of just publicly supported it, but I don't think he or she uh, took it to the, to, to the Congress. Li Yinhe, who is a, a well-known mm. sexologist and, and, and activist, has been trying to get Constantly. people to this she was year, the first, after year after she year. Was a, yes, she was the very first person. Star like 2003. Right. But she stopped in, uh, I think, 2010. And But after the other people pick up, try to do it. But, you know, like, uh, it just, uh, you know, we, we all know that. As a marriage, mm -hmm. it could be a really good advocacy for raising awareness, like it, uh, like uh, raising like the visible, you know, it's kind of creating the visibility for gay people. But you know, that's not uh, now. You know, we, you know, that's really going to pass like a same-sex marriage law. You know, that's for sure. Because you normally, if you see the country how they, uh, you know, uh, how achieve they that moment, you have to have like anti-discrimination law first. We haven't had anti-discrimination law yet. So mm -hmm. you know, I, but it was really good move to raising the visibility because mm -hmm. that's kind of like a good issues for like people in China, this kind of family value to talk about, you know, because everybody want their kids have like happy marriage, you know, like uh, so. Well, Ben, you're somebody who travels uh, extensively <laughs> for your work and presumably for leisure as well. Um, in your travels, have you ever sort of 
compared the situation uh, in China with the countries that you've been in? And do you think, do you see things as worse or better, or is it something that you consciously think about? Oh, constantly. Uh, you have to. Like, when you, when you travel uh, outside China and just see things differently, it helps you, it helps you think clearly and look things more clearly back uh, in China as well. When, when I'm in somewhere like more literal, more open-minded, like in the States or uh, like Euro some European countries. C certain parts of the States. <laughs> yes, true. I guess I only uh, tr uh, choose, chose to uh, travel in the, the more liberal parts, like right. in the West Coast, uh, New York and right. stuff. Um, but when you when you travel like somewhere like in Thailand, you actually kind of feel oh this is you know similar. You kind of uh, see things you know how things are working there, and uh, this is a very popular uh, uh, notion that in, in Thailand uh, apparently families family members are more tolerable to the whole LGBT community, uh, but they just uh, they still. That being said, they still have a, a, a trouble accepting their family member as a gay as a gay person. Right, even though Thailand would share a lot of certain cultural elements with China in terms of being an, an Asian culture mm -hmm. and all that respect to elders. And even though it's like more socially acceptable, more socially accept, uh, tolerated nowadays, I guess when when it comes to like uh, when it's on a on a more personal level, it's hard to be accepted. And and, and I think. China is only half a step, maybe one step behind that. We're, we're moving towards that way. Right, that's positive. <laughs> and yes. you grew up in a small city, and you grew up in a, in a small city far to the west of China. What about the divide between urban and rural? There are gay clubs and bars in, in, in Beijing and places to go and social networks and organizations like yours. What about somebody who's in a small town in western or central China? What can be done there? Um, of course, people move to the city. Is that the only exa <laughs> that's why there are more gay people in the bigger cities. Right. Uh, I think Xiao Gang and I are both small town boys, uh, and I guess, well, for me, this is this this was actually one of the reasons why I came to the city. I think I would be more connected with my own people. And I will have more access uh, to the community, and I, I just know. Uh, and by doing that, I will be happier. Mm. Xiao Gang, I think this is a really good question because you know sometimes when the people because most most time you see the gay people are from big city. You you kind of you you forgot also in a gay community also have a class, you know like sometime that you know you, most of voice. Even this is why sometimes when, when you live in Beijing, Shanghai, people think, "Oh, see how China was in, you know, like uh, progressing, you know, better, you know, like uh, very liberal." But uh, actually, that's not really China. The Beijing and Shanghai just small part of it. There's a lot of people living in the third line, even like uh, no line cities, mm -hmm. and they have only one way they can meet with each other is like uh, internet so which is right. internet does play a big role but there's there's but there's not a lot of gay activities and right. to kind of like you know telling you how to being a gay and more just like you can meet other people well as you said ben when you were growing up in a, in a small town you didn't know anything you simply didn't have information access to information uh, but even once that information does come through um and even in cities like beijing and shanghai is there do you think too much of a don't ask, don't tell culture amongst LGBT communities? I would say, you know, if you say now, maybe, but if you said before, I don't think there's an even not don't ask, don't tell because people really have no idea who they are. Exactly. I think that's the, because, you know, like, uh, you could don't ask, don't tell is basically on like, you know who you exactly. are, you just don't, cannot say it. There's but no there's a lot of people it really doesn't really aware their sexuality. You know, they probably think about, oh yeah, I may find attractive. Yeah, I may find attractive by a, a same sex, but you know, they never really care to say, okay, this is, can be an identity. I can have my own rights. No, mm -hmm. they just feel like, okay, I'm weird. I shouldn't think about this way, think the other way. So, in because ter yeah, in because homosexuality also appear, these words appear only about a hundred years. So, you know, like, uh, before it's just about like a, a behave, 
but it just like 100 years become a word and become identity, become like uh, people start fighting for these rights. Right. So it, yeah. But e education and history, China does have a history of, oh, of, yeah. of in, in, in the distant <laughs> past, in times of emperors, of, of homosexual sort of concubines and so on. I mean, these exist in stories in classical literature. Do people not read them? Those happen, I guess, as like a, as a fashion. <laughs> fashion. Now, I think it's a good question. Yeah, we know. Now we know how almost every single like uh, empire they have like uh, the you know they, they have the same sex lovers. Okay. But you can never see this on our like uh, on our like uh, books. Nobody tell, telling you this. Even there's a really famous one, Chu Yuan. This is a like a, the a poet. Yeah, he was writing most poet about this, like how much he love about this, like uh, the the king. Mm -hmm. But when you read from like now, they interpret like you know he's just kind of like some kind of like a uh, I would read, how you say like the patriarch. Yeah, the patriarch. So it's like a very interesting like uh, you know interpretation like. Uh, right. You know. um, in 2014, I I in China, even in cities like like Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, do you ever come across discrimination, blatant discrimination in terms of work or, or, or simply in, in social life? Does it, does it depend in which circles you move? Like not, not really. I, I think I have to, I have to mention the, the fact that like, you know, this doctrine of mean confusion, uh, this, is the, this is like the way of thinking of Chinese mentality here. Unlike Americans, uh, in America or a lot of Western countries, that they are like you know, oh, 40 people are for it and 40 people are against it, and 10 to 20 people, 10 to 20 percent of people, don't know right like you know, which side they should take. And in China, it's exactly the opposite. Very few percent of people are against it, and very few uh, like um, amount of people are, are supporting it. And the huge number of people are in the middle, like you know, they just don't know which way to go. And that is where our work come in. We should um, educate these people and try to push them towards like, being liberal and open-minded about this. So when you're talking about education and, 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 and visiting schools, uh, do schools invite you or do you suggest, look, we should come along and, and, and perhaps talk to people? Um, is, it, is it something that, that you do some schools say, no, we're not interested? It has to do with a lot of kids nowadays. They are aware of what's going on. They want to do something about it. They kind of uh, come together and, and do things about it. They, uh, they, sometimes they put together like an organization inside the school or, uh, or like uh, some different schools they can uh, working together and they invite people over or yeah, just like all kinds of ways that happens. And also I think now there are more and more professors there, you know, they have a background like a sociology or like a gender study. So they also kind of start having more and more open-minded professors. They also want to bring outside the voice into the school. So this is how I think now there's a, also HIV issues. They also kind of the, the time to bring like, a, you know, a LGBT and stuff. So I think because those things, we kind of like, there's a lot of organizations like uh, grab this chance, you know, they kind of like uh, put a lot of information in the school, but only still in the university. You both sound pretty optimistic, I have to say, about of the way things are going. Um, for somebody born this year 2014 and who's going to grow up in china and uh, uh, identify themselves as as gay or lgbt what what do you see their future as ben well would it be better or worse the, oh definitely uh for the better i i hope like you know, by the time this person uh, gets the uh, legally getting married age uh, he will be able to get married if he wants to get married uh, you know, I wish could be better, but you also can see, you know, to see the last year what's happened with uh, Uganda, with Russia, with like uh, Nigeria, you know, things can go forward, also can go backwards. So I think w the one thing we have to be really alert, like, you know, the rights, y you know, you have to fight for your rights. You cannot just waiting for like uh, all the good life happen to you. I think that's a very important part for also for the, like a lot of Chinese people, you know. Wei Xia Gong, Ben Zhang, thank, thank you, you very much indeed for being on the level. Thank you for having us.